Hey, <laughs> so uh, I don't know where that came from, Marsh, but anyways, howdy. Well, hey, it is good to be with you. Welcome to our first installment of our series, The Church in a Divided Democracy. Anybody excited? That's at least more than what I got out of the 9 a.m. and the 5 p.m. last night, so I'll, I'll take it. So this is how our TED series works. I will always have a part one, part two. Uh, so no, part one's not gonna go 50 minutes and part two go 50 minutes, but about 50 minutes, 55 minutes in total. And so part one today, we will be covering how we have become so divided, thus the shirt. And then we will look at how does the church engage culture well, and I will give you a large framework. So here's what I need you to do though. First and foremost, I need you to breathe. Just breathe. <sighs> Release that tension, all right? Because I know we live in such a contentious society and even after the week, many people had, I get it. So, so you, you, you just need to breathe in this series. And so this series is all about how we, the church, engage culture. So, so just so that we're on the same page, let me help you understand culture real quick. Uh, there are at least seven spheres of culture. You have the family, you have celebration, which uh, is arts and entertainment. You have media, education, religion, which the church is in, economics or business, and then government. So those are the seven spheres of society, the seven spheres of culture. And what we will be looking at is how the church engages government in particularly. But I really want you to realize that the church is called to engage every sphere of culture for the glory of God and the good of the world in which we live. But those are the two that we will be tackling in this series. Now, I think it's no surprise that we live in a divided democracy. Now, don't come up to me afterwards and say, well, technically it's a constitutional republic. I get that, but undoubtedly our politicians don't either. So I'm using the word that we use in society, okay? So we live in a divided democracy. And I'm just gonna throw up a political map. You've seen these before, but this is just how divided we are. Red is Republican, blue is Democrat, and where there's kind of a blend, this kind of split. Uh, what you will see in that map is that really the coastal areas are uh, Democrat, uh, urban areas are Democrat, uh, the middle and the south kind of mainly uh, red, again, within, you know, with the exception of urban areas. And so we really are divided Midwest, Southern, uh, coastal sides. I mean, so we are politically divided. Did you know this too? That we are also divided as a county. This is an interesting uh, image that I came across this week, but blue Democrat, red Republican, and then purple is a blend split. That's Seminole County. Did you know that for the first time in almost like 60 plus years, Seminole County voted for a Democrat president. I mean, so we are what we would now call a swing county. How did we become so divided? Well, actually, I want you to realize that America has always been somewhat divided or, have, or they have had seasons or we have had seasons where we have been divided, like we were divided over whether or not we were gonna go to war with Britain. Uh, we were divided o over you know, how we're gonna set up government. We were divided over the Civil War. But now we do feel this really, this, this deep tension that we are a divided society. Where did that come from? Well, it really is over political ideology and values. This is a good graph right here. But in 1994, Pew Research began this study just to see how politically polarized America was. And they asked a, a series of questions. Now, if you wanna know what some of those questions are, uh, you can actually scan your guide and every single slide that I have and that I'm not even showing you is on that. Uh, you can also listen to Extra Takes tomorrow and I will share some of those questions. But back in 1994, there really wasn't much of a difference between the median Democrat answer and the median Republican answer. But look at it in 2017, and this is the most recent poll that we have. But look at how divided we are over political ideology and values. 
Uh, there's this gaping hole. And again, that was in 2017. Uh, look at some of these articles. And I could, have, I could put up article titles for days, but let me just give you five of them real quick. But we're also divided over race. Uh, we're divided over cultural issues like racism, accepting LGBTQ people. We are divided over woke. What does that even mean? And then even the fundamental goals of American society. Uh, we are divided ideologically. And this has actually led to people to use words like civil war. So like we read in the New York Times a couple of years ago, is civil war coming to America? Politico, uh, the threat of civil breakdown is real. And even the Guardian two years ago said the next US civil war is already here. We just refuse to see it. I mean, really the unum and e pluribus unum has been dissolved. I mean, so uh, there is no more unity in terms of a national unity. But I want you to realize that it's not just we Americans Americans that are divided. Did you know that the church is divided as well? So let me put up a graph. Now, many of you, you've seen this graph before, but these are all of just the denominations that exist, uh, like Christian denominations. Uh, Look at how fragmented we are. Uh, So this is just a basic principle. If we are so divided as a church that we can't even agree on theology, do you think we're going to agree on how to run a country and what that entails? The answer is no. <laughs> so anyways, uh, but, but this is another graph of how divided we are. So red is Baptist, uh, blue is Catholic, yellow is Christian, gr- uh, gray, Latter-day Saints, Lutheran is in your orange, and then Methodist is your green. And so it's just where concentrations of those denominations lie. I mean, you can just see where we are in terms of just the fragmentation there. Uh, When it comes to evangelicals, that's what Northland is. We are an evangelical church. And so that means we have have conservative theology. But when it comes to evangelicals, I want you to know that we are divided politically. This is interesting. So again, all Americans, so 31% of Americans are Democrats, 37% are independents, 24% are Republicans. Uh, Look at white evangelicals, 14% Democrat, 31% independents, and then 49% are Republicans, white. But it changes with black and Hispanic evangelicals. Do you see how divided we are politically in just evangelicalism? So we're not going to necessarily be moving the needle politically because we are so fragmented. So the question is, is how do we become so divided? How do we become so fragmented as a nation and even as a church? Well, I'm gonna give you five reasons. Now, this is, these are general, and so I'm not gonna be able to do a deep dive, but I'm gonna give you a framework, five reasons of why we have become so divided as a nation and even so divided as a church. All right, number one, seeds of pluralism are now producing fruit. So now we're living in the 21st century, 2024, and really over the last 25, 50 years, we have have seen the seeds of pluralism produce fruit. What do I mean by pluralism? Well, I'm glad that you asked. Here's what pluralism is. The difference in diversity within a group or a nation caused by a collection of racial, ethnic makeup, cultural expressions, religious views, and ultimately one's view of the world. We are a pluralistic nation where there's a lot of racial and ethnic makeup. Uh, There's a lot of different cultural expressions. There are a lot of different religious views and there, there are a lot of different views of how one would view the world. Now, where, where was the seedbed of pluralism? Where was it defined? Well, it actually was defined in the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights, which says, Congress shall not make no law respecting an establishment of religion. In other words, America was not going to have a state-run religion. They wanted all Americans to be free to worship whoever or whatever they wanted to. There's the seedbed of pluralism. And now over 250 years later, we are seeing all the diversity and all of the pluralism take shape. Let me give you some religious affiliations real quick though. So in 2003, here was the makeup of the American population. 50% were Protestant, 22% were Catholics, uh, 11% were other Christians. So like your non-denominational church, churches of which Northland would be one, uh, no religion, so no religious affiliation, and then 4% other religions. Now look at it in 2017. 
So Protestantism is shrinking. Catholics kind of remain in the same. Non-denominationalism is growing, but look at what else is growing. The, the no religion or no religious affiliation. They are the nuns. Now again, this is 2017. We are actually in 2024. This number has grown by, by a few percentages to 28% of the American population are nuns. Protestantism continues to decline. I want you to look at even how fragmented we are when it comes to the composition of generations in terms of pluralism. Look at this. So silent generation, that's your oldest generation, your boomers, your Gen Xers, your millennials, and your Gen Z. So Protestant is blue, Catholic is light blue, other world religions, atheist agnostic, and nothing in particular. Do you see how Gen Z, it is the growing generational cohort that has no religious affiliation whatsoever. So they're going to become the, the, the generation that occupies the seats of power in the next 10, 20, 30 years. They have no religious affiliation. I want you to realize, and people, I don't think people realize this, is that regardless of what your faith is in, it never remains private, it always becomes public. It always becomes public, regardless of what your faith is. And so we are seeing the fruit of pluralism. But the second reason why we have become so divided and fragmented is over the erosion of Christian religion. The erosion of Christian religion here in the US. Well, what, what do you mean by that? Well, let me give you some seasons that America has experienced in terms of the fragmentation and the erosion of Christian religion. So, so really in the 1800s, early 1900s, you have the rise of liberal mainline Protestant churches. Some of you might ask, well, what, what churches are those? Well, those will be churches like the United Methodist Church, the Episcopal Church, the United Church of Christ, the Presbyterian Church USA. And what you had with the rise of liberal mainline Protestants is that they lost the centrality of the word of God. They no longer saw the Bible as the word of God. That they didn't see it any, any longer as the inerrant inspired word. It was just a religious document. And, and so, the, so there's now no authority. And, and then also they, they lost the centrality of Jesus's death and resurrection. I mean, some of them would even say that uh, Jesus really didn't rise from the dead. And so you, you had this rise of liberal Protestant where they lost a, a binding authority. They lost the vocabulary of sin. And, and so that, that's coming on the scene. And then you had the rise of the social gospel movement in the early 1900s. And so you have advocates like Walter Rosenbush, who was a Baptist pastor actually in Hell's Kitchen, New York, that saw all of the societal ills and he's reading the gospels and he's like, man, Jesus, he cared for the poor. He met needs, he healed people. The church needs to do that. Well, what happened was, is that many in the social gospel movement was also part of the mainline Protestant uh, churches. And they're like, well, hey, look, we need to do that. We need to care for the poor. We need to care for the sick. But in, in, in embracing a social gospel, they lost the proclamation of the gospel. And so then you had the rise of fundamentalists that's actually reacting to mainline Protestantism and the social gospel movement. And they're like, we need to preach the word. We're not gonna lose the centrality of the word. The word of God, the Bible is the inspired, inerrant, infallible word. And then as they see society becoming more progressive, especially in public education, in those centers of higher education, what they did is they removed themselves from those areas and they created their own colleges, universities, and seminaries. And so they're gonna to try to protect and conserve the values of the past, but do, but, but do so in an isolated fashion. And, and then, so now you have to understand the rise of fundamentalists happened in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. But then in the late 70s, 80s, and 90s, you have the rise of the moral majority. So leaders like Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson, they come on the scene, they see where America is headed, they don't like where America is headed, and so they rally evangelicals, which become a major voting block in the American landscape of, of, of politics. 
And so what they're trying to do is protect the erosion of the values, but they'll start using terminology like culture wars. Uh, we need to win back America. We need to uh, you know, reclaim America. And, and really you have some streams that are branching off of the moral majority like the Tea Party and other, other kind of sects that kind of came out of that moral majority. This is the fragmentation and erosion of Christian religion. Like we are so fragmented as a sect of Christianity. Now, what you actually have, and here's the next chart I'll show you, is that in the past, like in the 17, 18, 1900, you know, kind of, you know, mid 19, up to mid 1900s, you had non Christians, the cultural divide, and then you had cultural, congregational, and convictional Christians that basically operated within the same worldview of a framework. But cultural Christians were, they were Christians by name, didn't really attend church. Then you had congregational Christians that they would go occasionally, but then your convictional Christians, I mean, they're sold out. I mean, they're in church all the time. They're studying their Bible. They know what they believe. But, they, but in terms of a worldview and a culture, the divide was between non-Christians and Christians. Today, we're living in a society where cultural and congregational Christians think just like non-Christians. And the cultural divide is between convictional Christians, which is why if you have been sold out to King Jesus over the last 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, you now fill this divide. All right, so, so we have the erosion and the fragmentation of Christian religion. Here's the third reason why we've become so divided. And it's over Burger King sociology. Now, now again, I, I was having a conversation after the nine o'clock. Listen, I'm not saying anything bad here. I'm just stating the facts. And here's how Burger King sociology works. Because Burger King used to have a motto, my, you know, your way, what? Right away. Your way, right away. Well, th this is what our society has become. Uh, we, want my, we want my choice. My body, my choice. Uh, we want to redefine marriage. You do realize that when we as a society redefined marriage in 2015, we opened up Pandora's box to, in some sense, redefine whatever we wanted to. And then we have an open season sexuality. If you, want to, if, you, if you want to be homosexual, you be homosexual. You want to be bisexual, be bisexual. You want to be a furry, be a furry. Like we're just living in this, this season where it's just have it your way. Whatever way you want it, you can have it your way. And then legalizing substance. I mean, Americans, they want to be able to smoke whatever they want to smoke, snort whatever they want to snort, chew whatever they want to chew, and pop whatever they want to pop. It is Burger King sociology. And we are so fragmented because of of that. Hey, here's the next. Here's the next reason why we become so divided. Skepticism in general and skepticism of institutions in particular. Well, what, what do you mean by that, Josh? Well, here's the general is that there are no more moral absolutes. Like, we're just going to question everything. And then we live in a selfie-centered world, whatever is true for me. Like, so... So people would say, well, this, this is my truth. I, you know, you, you have your truth. But here's the thing. If everybody has their own individual truth, then we have eroded the fabric of solidarity. Look at all of this. This is even more specific. So this is, all right. So people were asked this question. Identifying moral truth is up to each individual. There are no moral absolutes that apply to every person all of the time. Do you agree with this? That, that was the question. Do you agree with this statement? Look at this. Those who attend evangelical churches, 46% of them agreed that there is no moral absolute. There's no universal truth applied across the board. Look at this. Born again Christians, 48% of them said there's no, I mean, you, you see like, so we, we have no, we, we are now, we are in a completely skeptical society of what is even true and false. And then the confidence in our institutions are waning. So uh, Gallup did this poll and they've been doing this poll since 1977. But let me just show you this real quick. All right, so confidence in our institutions of television news. This is the number on, on my left, your right, I want you to see. 14% of Americans actually feel confident in television news. Here's another one. So we got the criminal justice system. I think that number is gonna go down after this week. But 17% of Americans really trust the criminal justice system right now. Uh, here's the presidency, 
26% of Americans in some sense have confidence in the presidency. Now Congress, y'all know this, 8% of people really do trust Congress. Like the House and Senate, man, we really trust them to pull through for us. Uh, here's the Supreme Court, 27% of Americans. Only, only, only 27% of Americans trust the Supreme Court. And here's, my, here's the fun one, the church and organized religion. 30, a whopping 32% of you have confidence in what I'm saying. <laughs> Y'all need to laugh a little bit. I know, I know it's a little tense here. But we have, we have seen the erosion now of confidence. Listen, if we don't have trust, we can't even have a functioning society. All right, and then number five, number five. A new chapter with no overarching story. There's no grand story, no meta narrative or bonding center anymore in American life. Now there has been a shift. Now, regardless of whether or not you agree with what it was, there has been a shift and here's the shift. For God and country to for me, myself and I, that has been the shift that we have seen. So there's no longer any overarching story in which we embed our nation. Our now nation is embedded into the story of me, myself, and I. Uh, Listen to what James Davidson Hunter writes in his book, Culture Wars. At issue are two relatively distinct and competing visions of public life. To identify the predominant and polarizing tendencies as orthodox, which would be right, and progressive, which would be left, suggests a great deal about the nature of these visions. What he's saying, and he was writing this in 1991, is that there is no unison any longer about the vision of the future of America. That the right and left, they are at odds with one another and cannot agree on a future direction. Here's what uh, Yuval Levine writes in his book, The Fractured Republic. In our cultural, economic, political, and social life, The trajectory since World War II has been a trajectory of increasing individualism, diversity, dynamic, and liberalization. And it has come at the cost of dwindling solidarity, which is unity, cohesion, stability, authority, and social order. We are no longer centered around any major narrative of who we are as a country. And this is what it has led to. It has led to a marginalized church, which is why conservative Christians actually feel marginalized because we are. We also now have culture wars. Now, again, these culture wars started in the late 70s, 80s, but they still go on now and they are over values. And then what has enhanced though is the cancel culture. So if you have a value that I don't like, I'll just cancel you. I'll ask because I don't, I don't appreciate what the kicker of the Kansas City Chiefs, that's what people are saying, said, we need, we, we need the NFL to fire them because again, this is a culture war, but it's over now canceling them. And then it's resentment. Resentment is the demonization of the other person. That if you don't like what they believe, you just loathe them, you despise them, you hate them, and all you can do is cast them as more than a a human and you dehumanize them and you deplore them. And that is what our political environment has become. We just resent one another. So let me give you, because I left a little bit of time, I left two minutes to give you these pictures that I did not give the nine o'clock, so you're welcome. So let me give you this picture. So when, when America was founded, it, it was founded upon Judeo-Christian values. And you cannot argue that. Now, it was not founded as a Christian nation. If it was founded as a Christian nation, they would force everybody to be Christian. That's not what happened. But here's what happened. The Enlightenment values and the Judeo-Christian values had a baby called America, which is why they call it an American experiment. As long as they held these things in tension, America in some sense was fine. But here's what has happened. Let me put up another graph for you. That over time, is particularly in the last hundred or so years, an enlightenment secular mindset has set into the center of America. And it has infiltrated every sphere of society. So when you look at the cultural elites in America, they have, most of them have an enlightenment secular mindset, which is why the church feels so uncomfortable because it is not the nation that was founded. 
So this is what I'm wanting you to really understand of what we're trying to accomplish here at Northland, not only in this series, but in our existence. Because what we have to, well, and so go to the, the next one where it says Jesus in the center. So that, that's where you feel this. So they have left the Judeo-Christian values and went more to the enlightenment. But this is what we got to get to, is that we got to teach you of what it means to be salt and light in every sphere of culture. Like I hope and pray, because I know that a lot of Gen Z, you're sitting out here. I want you to sit in places of government. I want in the next 10, 20 years that the next president of the United States will come out of Northland. But what we have to do is understand what God has called us to do as his believers living in our day and age so that we can be salt and light, not part of the problem. All right, so here's what I want you to do. So that's the end of part one, all right? So, but I need you to take out your phone because I wanna conduct a poll for part two because we now are living in this political season and so uh, we like to conduct polls. So if you will scan that QR code right there and you will be whisked to a, to a question, I want you to answer that question and then in the next uh, you know, few moments, uh, we will start part two. So you scan. Scan that QR code, answer the question, and then we will start part two. 